All right, guys, welcome back to the Best Hour of Their Day podcast. Jason here, my good buddy, Mr. Brian Shantosh, brother. Thanks for coming on the show, dude. Yeah, man, of course. It's good to see you. Yeah, I know you're a busy man, so I appreciate it. We're doing this one uh, later in the evening, so um, uh, Brian's all over the place. Uh, better known as Tosh in some circles. So, um, But uh, for those of you who don't know Tosh, um, give a little bit of a background here. Spent 20-plus uh, years in the Marine Corps, both enlisted and on the officer side. Um, has also been in the CrossFit community for well over 10 years at this point, right? Yeah. Um, does a lot of endurance stuff. Um, is the creator and purveyor of the annual madness challenge, which I have, um, I'm ashamed to say, I think I've only completed it once. I think I've only made it through the full year one time. <laughs> That's, yeah, right. It's fun though. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, he's doing some other stuff uh, as far as this crooked butterfly. And uh, but yeah, we're gonna get into all that stuff, man. But um, I was trying to think about when I first became aware of Tosh, and I was this is way back, dude. I saw a video. It was at a competition of some sort, and I don't even know if you remember this. It was either like a regional or like back before it was regionals, and somebody had video of you doing some air squats or something like that. And you were going for it. Like you were, you were, you was full send and like the squats were a little, you know, they might've been a little shy on the hip extension and you know, as do the internet trolls come out, they came out and like everybody was just hammering like, Oh, this dude's shaving a wrap. So he's not standing up all the way. And I was like, I don't know, dude. And then I think you came out and made a statement. You're like, yeah, those squats are trash. I, I got to have better standards for myself. And I apologize. None of that was good. And I was like, I like this guy. He's a good dude. Yeah, that's funny. That might have been the regionals back in. I, I think it was the regionals, man. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but you, I was thinking about this. When you were telling me you're leaving in a week, are you going out to shoot with Andy and Dudley next week? No, man, I wish I'm headed to, uh, I got a client in DC working, oh, okay. I've been working with him for a couple of years now and I'm got just it. awesome to see his progress and, yeah. and I'm going to take a, take a 10 day private session, shut the world down and just hang out with my kids for summer vacation. Yeah. I forgot. I forgot to tell the world you're, are you, you still got the boat, the tugboat? Oh yeah, man. Got the tugboat. Love that bad boy. <laughs> Josh is also a self-proclaimed tugboat captain as well. <laughs> yeah, man. Awesome. Um, too. That's cool, man. Um, so, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know kind of Tasha's story, I, you know, I don't want to dive too much deep into it because I know you've told that story and a lot of people know that. But if, you, if you're not aware of Tasha's story, you know, look it up, Google it. It'll come up pretty quick. Um, and, uh, and it's important. It's important. It's important part of, of his history and his growth as a person that he's talked about repeatedly over the years. And um, I kind of want to dive in a little bit more to where some of that stuff has led you today. You know, so I, so I know you talk about it quite a bit and it's kind of led you to do some of your ultra endurance races and some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, but the first one I want to ask you about is the, the, it's not the most recent one. Cause you and Chris just did one in Australia. Yeah. New Zealand. We did uh, God's own together, which was, you know, incredible. God's Zone's an incredible adventure race, you know, uh, four to 500 miles spanning seven to eight days. Just amazing. How much? So I know, I know very little about that world, but what's the, get, tell me a little bit about, and some of the listeners who are not aware of some of that stuff that like, this is minimal kind of pack out, correct? Yeah. It's um, well, I mean, I guess the best way to do it is, is the eco challenge, which is coming back this year. Oh, it is. Funny enough, and Chris is actually doing it. Um, but um, the, you know, this was spurned by the Eco Challenge or spawned by the Eco Challenge. It's a multidisciplinary event that you, you, it's it's like start and it just continues, and you just keep chasing cutoff times as you travel a course. You, it's all navigating with compass and map, and you know, mountain biking, hiking, swimming, kayaking, boating, coaster rearing, what, whatever it is. You just go from event to event to event nonstop until you make the finish line. And depending on the, the type of race, your, your loadout, I mean, you don't want to carry the kitchen sink. Um, and there's resupplies along the way as long as you get and navigate to these certain places. So um, it's, it's, it's wild, man. There's strategy involved. There's talent, there's skills, there's leadership. There's, you know, self-management, you know, controlling your own emotions and your own fatigue, all, everything. You know, it's, it's really cool. And you do it in yeah. a team. 
I think I, I think I was actually working with Andrea the weekend you guys did that, and she was she had kind of gotten some updates from, or maybe it was like right after you guys had finished. Uh, but I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm talking about uh, Chris and Andrea Smith who own um, Trident CrossFit. Who I'm I'm actually going to get them on the show together. So we'll see yeah. how that goes. <laughs> they're both amazing. Both they're they're amazing. like two like two of the people I look up to the most as far There's as just like us. just people and business people and just like just salt of the earth kind of people in general, but. Um, so Chris is a former, uh, Navy SEAL and, and, but probably a pretty good teammate to have in those scenarios, I would imagine. Yeah, we click him and I, we just sort of, ever since I first met him, it was back 2007 at a level one seminar. And, um, it was, you know, Dave Castro, my role at that time is, I was, I was kind of like an intern or something. I don't even know what it was way back then, but yeah. my role was to just kind of hang out at seminars and demo or workout or do whatever and then we did the afternoon workout and it was like okay hey like your job is to crush these people if you can and <laughs> dave pitted me against chris he's like hey you see that guy right there i'm like yeah he's like you need to beat him I'm like, okay cool okay got it minutes go by, we get to the start line or something and he says hey you can just go and he's, you know he taps me and he says yeah oh hey by the way he's a he's a navy seal it's like okay whatever you know i'm a marine he's navy seal and and <laughs> he I'm assuming he said was saying some things to Chris. Uh, so I, have I, no I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt he teed that up. Dude, man, it was uh, – we went after it. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. It just everybody's in the pain cave together just like, oh, I'm not going to let you win. Yeah, he's another one. He's yeah. like sneaky fit too. He's old. I know. He looks like he's 30 years old, but he's not. And he looks like – you know, and, man, he just goes. He's, he's in some shape sneaky fit dude like he'll just sneak yeah. up on you and you're like how did you do that <laughs> um but how did you have you always been like a because you're you're pretty heavy into the and in some of the ultra or endurance race stuff like how did you do you just kind of find that randomly or like because i know you kind of were in the marine corps and the marine corps is into running and doing all that shit and um but i know you were heavy into crossfit for a while I and mean, then how did you end up kind of in that endurance world mm-hmm uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, I had a different mindset towards, towards training in my early officer career, you know, 2001, 2002, uh, we, we were just doing a lot of, um, all, all singular too, right? Like, um, singular modalities at the time we'd hit the gym in Jackson steel and we'd hit the pool and then we'd go for okay. runs and we'd go for hikes and the old course, punch the old course, but never really combining it all together. And, um, I was at the infantry officers course and some guy, Marcus Mines, was like, Hey guys, Hey guys, check this out. He, you know, we all get up you're at work at four 30 in the morning around the computers. Check this out. Check this out. This workout thing. And, uh, he shows us CrossFit.com. I'm like, okay, hey, cool. We're going to do that at lunch. And so after doing that and then just feeling like, Hey, this is pretty cool. Let's just add this to the routine. And then, um, we started doing that, sort of getting in shape, started getting involved. I went to a level one seminar. Greg was there and, um, then I was on a, I had to go back up to Rochester to be the um, guest of honor for some, something, okay. speed, whole nine yards, graduation, I think it was. And I ran into um, the Marine officer instructor up there. He's the guy that invited me and he's like, hey man, we need another teammate for, for something. It might be right up your alley. And this was an event called Primal Quest. And I was like, okay, cool. What is it? And he's like, well, you, you know, and he explained just like I did a minute ago about what, what adventure racing was. I'm like, all right, sign me up, man. Let's do it. And so I went out to Utah and did my first. It's the biggest, baddest expedition race in North America, if not like the world really, like 10 days, 500 plus miles, just devastating. And um, that was my introduction. That was my first race. And I was just hooked since then. That must you finish been. it? 2006 yeah we were the first all military team to have finished primal quest i don't think there was an all military at that time i think it was only the third yeah. year that had been around but um it was a cool accomplishment you know we were short course we didn't finish the full pro course but um it was a cool accomplishment you know and i just been stuck i've been i've been hooked on it ever since no i can tell because the, the one of the more recent ones you did which is just the most insane thing i've ever heard is you locked yourself in a connex box and just ran for was it 24 hours yeah that's right that's right that was a good one but that one that one's for a fundraiser so that one was a little bit different it was it was um so the, the project originated with these two canadians um near ottawa or something and they always challenged themselves with hard stuff and they came up with an idea 
to do a sensory deprivation type challenge and see who would win. And they, somehow they got uh, Jeff Vernon involved in true form running. Mm -hmm. And Jeff was like, yeah, man, we'll support it. No problem. And, and it started out it was just going to be, Hey, we just need two true form runners at some army depot in Canada. And then Jeff put together an advisory team for these two guys. Um, you know, uh, Maftone nutritionist running Ian Adamson, famous adventure racer, um, a couple other guys. And they, they had access to the true form running university to, to do some training and whatever. And Jeff and I go back a while and he said, Hey man, we need to bring Tosh in to, to help you guys with your, your mental game and, and strategy and, and stuff like that. Um, so Jeff is a guy that supports me in most of my, like my, he's, he's supported me in my 200 milers. Yep. And so I came and I heard the project and I was like, Oh man, this is pretty awesome. And how, how do I get in? I'm super happy to advise these guys, but I want to participate. And so they, uh, they said, yeah, and we did it. So it was a, a sensory deprivation challenge where you get locked in a, a conics box, a shipping container. And you know, there's no light in there. You take the monitor off your true form runner you aren't allowed to watch you're not allowed to have headphones any type of um artificial motivation or anything it's just you in the dark with purpose just go for 24 hours whoever goes the farthest wins I, for and, those people that have not been in a shipping container it is less than a comfortable environment <laughs> Yeah, it's it literally locked in a box, man. Yeah. Like that Allison Chain song. There's, you know, there's no airflow. It's dark. It smells. It's scary. So, and uh, what did, how much distance did you cover? I did, I did 82 and a half, I think was the number. There was two, there was two systems of measuring. I think there was like 80.9 and 82 and a half. I'll, I'll yeah. take credit for 82. Why not, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, I'll, I'll give it to you. You've earned it. It was good, man. It was really good. Was that was that one of the tougher? Which one is the tough one, the toughest one you've ever done? Arrowhead one thirty five, hundred percent, no doubt. Really? Yeah, that was the toughest uh, race I had ever done. Um, I thought this shipping container was going to be the hardest thing I've ever done, and um, I was a little bit apprehensive, you know. And I just I talk about it in a lot of different places. Um, I think even on my own podcast, I think I carved it up, um, or maybe I haven't, and I need to. But I just took my set of experiences because I've never never done anything like this. Mm -hmm. But if you dissect the challenge ahead of you in small parts, it's similar in ways to other things that you've done. And so I tried to, to slice that, a Malcolm Gladwell thing, you know, slice it up, combine it over here and, and best approximate what I was going to experience and come up with a strategy and a plan. And uh, I was like, hey, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. I've run for 24 hours before I've run well farther in a single yeah. shot than, than 24 hours or a hundred miles. Not a, not a big deal. I've been in the dark before. I'm, I'm not, I'm super resistant to, uh, or I have high thresholds against, you know, discomfort and I can stay pretty focused, but never all of this stuff. And even more, there was a bunch more other things like yeah. at once in the absolute dark. And so um, I just created a strategy. I'm, I'm actually really, really proud of the way I, I did that. Um, I just nailed it. I happened to get lucky and, and nail the thought process, or at least the thought process was, you know, resonated with how I naturally think and um, was, was really successful. But um, the Arrowhead 135 was by, has been by far the hardest event I've ever accomplished. Was that, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of unwrap that in my brain a little bit. And do you, so it sounds like you had, I don't want to say like played up the, the, the shipping container one to be really potentially devastating. And then you essentially over prepared for it. Were you, do you feel like you underestimated one thir the 135? Um, so, so like the 135, I failed at it twice. Um, I certainly part of the first time I failed was a overinflated sense of self for sure. Overconfidence, yeah. you know, a little arrogance, um, and an underestimation of how hard it was going to be. It was just kind of like a combination of those two things. And I quit and it wasn't physical. It was psychological failure. I just quit. And I was ashamed and it bothered me. I was, you know, uh, talked to Nicole about it. We, we joke about it now, but like it sent me into a, 
early stages of depression. Uh, I had some other things going on in my life too. So this was like a, it was, it was big. It was heavy. How, and, how far, uh, how far removed from the Marine Corps were you at this point? I was still in. Oh, okay. Yeah, was, okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was at the Naval Academy finishing up on my last tour and I had never, I had never quit before, you know? So this was huge. This was big. And it's on the tails of, um, uh, a little bit of hubris going into, um, the Sweden, the monster Sweden 500 kilometer adventure race, like six months prior and almost dying. And worse than that, putting the lives of my teammates in jeopardy because I was just too arrogant and um, something I'm really ashamed of. And then bang, you know, so these back-to-back events like that. And I went back to the Arrowhead a second time the next year. It was, was just crushing the course, massive snowstorm. It was, it was super gnarly out there. And um, I quit. At, uh, farther than I did the first time, I quit it. Uh, I forget what distance I quit the second time. First time I quit at 82 and a half. Oh, no, the second time I quit at the actually at the halfway point. And it wasn't a physical or psychological thing. It's just like, hey, I don't need to do this. I've, 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 I've won. I've fixed myself. I've proven that I can do it. I'm not interested in doing this. I don't like doing this shit alone. Like I, and I got into this. And this is where I kind of started to um, intellectually develop my thoughts on, like, the mind's mind and how it tricks mm-hmm. you and – I just totally gave in to the mind's mind tricking me that I was satisfied and content and I had succeeded when um, it, the mind's mind actually changed the, the parameters for measuring and it fooled me. And it wasn't until I just jumped in the truck and left like 15 minutes down the road. I was like, what did I just do? How did I just, I just let myself deceive myself. Like how did that even happen? And I was killing the course, you know, and I had trained for it and prepped for it. So that haunted me for a while again. And, um, I quit adventure racing for a while, quit doing ultra endurance stuff, focusing on, you know, finishing up the Marine Corps strong and managing a, a, a terrible, um, situation with my, my ex-wife that just wasn't going anywhere positive and with my children. And finally we did Primal Quest, Chris Smith and I, with the chance we did Primal Quest in, um, Tahoe and that was, uh, an absolute failure for a lot of different reasons, but yeah, I was going to say in what regard, like, yeah, just, uh, you know, nothing even really, we need to even talk about. I don't yeah, think, yeah. you know, just, it just didn't work out, man. Yeah. And, um, it didn't meet expectations in, in most ways it, it exceeded ex- or it, it, it fulfilled me in certain areas. I never expected. They always do. Um, but it was a giant letdown. And, um, Chris, I remember just driving to dinner with Chris and he's like, you know, man, I didn't, I didn't earn my trident this year. Cause that was the big race, you know, that we we're going to, I didn't earn my trident this year. Like that was, and I was like, yeah, man, I hear you. He's like, we got to do something. We have, we have to do something. I'm like, I got one. And I mean, I hadn't done the arrowhead in like three, four years. Didn't even yeah. think about it. It was just, just and he's like, all right, let's do it. So Chris and I went up to arrowhead and I kind of finished it that year. So that's cool. That, race that actually hard. brings up, it brings up a, this is a solely selfish question for me personally, you know, so like um, just failure in general, right? So, you know, none of us are going to navigate life without getting smacked around by some failure. You know, what, what is something you've maybe learned about yourself? Cause I find myself staring down the barrel of quite a bit of that this year, particularly in a lot of different weird areas. And uh, again, not, not something I've had a ton of experience with. I've always been like, fairly successful with things that I've done. And, um, but I've, there, there have been some instances where I've been, where I've struggled to deal with what that means and how do I deal with it and how do I navigate that moving forward? And, you know, what does that, is, what does that for mean for me as a person? And, and, and how is that going to define my path moving forward? How, how have you kind of figured out some ways to, to deal with that? Cause that's a lot of what you're doing with Crooked Butterfly, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I mean, there's a lot there. I think you hit the first, I think you hit the first thing right on it for me. You, you said it yourself, like, I'm not, how am I going to let this define me moving forward? You know, um, my failure, the, the question I have when, um, I, I don't meet expectations or measurements of success that have been given to me or I've created for myself, right? I don't, I don't meet or exceed those. I say, okay, hey, do I want this to be what defines me? 
is this what I want to be known for? Like, hey, no, like, okay, so there, the answer is no. Okay, now what? Like, so what? No, like, what are you going to do? How are you going to, how are you going to then leverage this to learn to set conditions for, for growth or to adapt? And then how are you going to rechallenge yourself? How are you going to reframe um, the situation and, and what standards and expectations and you can reasonably reset or baseline, you know, so I could go through a, a ton of stuff in my head. Like, man, was I, was I just too arrogant? Was I unprepared? Was I just misinformed? Did I miss something? Did I calculate wrong? Did I assume too many things? Did I, I, I have a personal problem with building up expectations and it leads to disappointment or, or failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I try to pull that thread back to origin and it's like, okay, hey, what, well, why did I have these expectations? What were, what were, what were the signals that were coming in that made me or allowed me to, to go there in my head that this is going to be what it was going to be, you know, and then you go through and you confirm or deny whether they were, they were appropriate or not to, to, to formulate your expectations, you know? And so failure, you know, you can, you can use any cliche saying, you know what I mean? They're all out there, but it's, it's really, it's like, okay, it's an opportunity for growth really failure is an opportunity for growth like it sucks and it hurts but you know what sucking and hurting is a part of life i mean i don't want to get this into a, a, a what's wrong with the world world you think but it's like hey everything's not hunky dory you know everything's yeah. not like be okay it's okay that things are not okay what's not okay about being not okay is for you to just wallow in it or you to just accept substandard results or performance or status quo that's what's not okay but it is absolutely okay to to have failure to have disappointment to have hurt to have sadness to have embarrassment and then when you embrace those things you say okay hey cool let's, let's not try to uh, you know cowtail to them or, or cover them up or pacify those like sit there and think about that for a while and now what do you, I'm going to sit back and like, if, if, if I'm watching somebody else go through this process of failure, my job isn't to give them the whoopee blanket and say, it's okay. It's to say, yeah, you, you, you sucked right there. Yeah. Let me, you know why you sucked? Think about it for a little bit and then and go. And then, Hey man, this is what I saw, or this is what I think, or man, let's, how can I help you get through this? Or where do you want to go? Or what are we going to do about it now? And then we can, we can activate from that. Whereas the other way there's, there's, there's no activation possible. I, I think what you brought up there is probably one of the biggest missing links for most people is that objective party who, who's not there judging, but is there just observing and, and being very candid with what they observe. I was pretty fortunate. Like that was my dad growing up. And I find myself sometimes missing that, that objective party who's going to be like, Hey, you're being a complete moron right now. Like, do not do that. Uh, and I, cause I find, um, that people, maybe people are afraid to say you suck or that's a, that's a super shitty idea, um, for whatever reason. And I kind of wish more people would say that more frequently. They're just like, Hey, you should probably not do that. Mm -hmm. Cause I would, I would listen, you know, like I would actually appreciate it. I'd be like, man, that was, and I, and I think, I don't know how you are, but like, that's kind of how I operate. And that's why I struggle with it a little bit. Like to some degree, I need somebody to be that blunt about it. Like if somebody beats around the bush around it, I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. But I need somebody who's going to kind of put it in my face and just be like, listen, this is going to blow up and you're going to eat shit. You know? Yeah. I, I seek it out. I look for people to share an audience with, to share friendship with that are willing to give me that and will and, and desire that in return. Um, it's a lonely place to be because it seems like they're few and far between these days. Um, but I'll even go one, one step further. It's like, I don't like to tell people not to do something. I like to open up their eyes a little bit of their mind. And be like, okay, hey, cool. Like I hear what you're saying, but if you do that, like, have you thought about what's going to happen or what are the consequences or what that creates the second order, third order effects? Like, okay, hey man, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to like maybe give you a different way or two ways of thinking based on either experiences or different platform for observation like okay just think about that for a second in this frame or that frame um if you still want to do it hey cool man let me know let me know how to support man i'm going to be here to catch you when you fall or or maybe i won't be you know or and i'm i'm not the kind of guy 
that likes it's funny because I had a, an Instagram exchange with somebody and it was, I forgot what post it was I did. And then he came back and said, Oh, what I like to do is to try to frame it instead of being, I told you so, or I know it all. It's like, Hey, this is how I've done it in the past. And it worked for me. And I'm like, that's just a bullshit way of telling somebody what to do. Yeah. It's just you, you know what I mean? And yeah, so you're not, you're not, that's, that's not trying to unpack what they're, what mentally they're going through. That's just like, this is my experience. Take it or leave it. You know? And, and those yeah. are the ones I, I agree. Those kind of turn me off. I'm like, you're not, that's not forcing me to think about anything. That's not forcing introspection of, of any type. That's not, that's not forcing growth on my end or making me uncomfortable in any way, shape or form. Um, yeah. So it can be, I, unin it can be unintentional and, and it's, it maybe it's just, it, but, it, but I find that it's one step above the know-it-all, right? Like yeah. The, or the person always says, well, you know, I did it this way. It might be valuable for you or hey, in my experience, like, you know, and it worked and like, okay, that's one step above the person that says, I know it all, Yeah. you know? let's go two or three steps farther than that. Like you're talking about, and let's talk about growth and, and, and transformation. You know, I forget where it was. I read this once that it takes, it takes seven whys to actually get to the point. Like you have to ask somebody why seven times before you get past all the nonsense, all the superfluous stuff. And before you really get down to that root cause about like, why are you doing that? And it, and it usually comes, it's, you know, because they feel inadequate or you're, you know, you're trying to portray it to be something that you're not, but you have to get through all the other six things before that. They're just like, Oh, I, you know, I want to do it because it'd be fun. Um, and so I always appreciate, uh, some of the best mentors I had were the ones that never really told me to do anything. They just asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that Jedi mind trick where you're like, they get you to say what they, what they want you to say, but you yeah. came up with that answer yourself. Yeah. Because I think, and you, and you do this now professionally, but I think, and you can tell me what you think, but I, I would imagine that you're not going to convince anybody of anything. Yeah, it's not your job. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not supposed to be salesmen. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's I just want trying to get salesmen. people to get people to come to that conclusion on their own based on their own ideas and their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. So um, that they can, make, they can make the decisions in the future in your absence. Right? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was my whole deal. premise, you know, yeah. back in the, in the core. I'm just, and it's not mine. Like you saying, teach them to fish. I mean, that's from the biblical days, right? Like, yeah. give them a fish or teach them to fish something, something. And it's just, I, who cares about the answers that you have? Your answers are relevant to you and your experiences, right? But what I get most excited about are what questions are you asking? I don't want to give people answers. I want to ask people questions to get them to think. I want to, I'm constantly seeking how to learn how to think still, you know, you're, you're, I, I follow, you know, obviously, you know, we've known each other for a couple of years on seminar staff and uh, yours, yours is one of the few Instagram feeds that like when I see it and I, I see something that you've posted on there because I know you, I know you've put some time and effort into what you're putting on there. So I will stop what I'm doing to take the time to read it and really try to soak it up where the rest of it is just, you know, just to scroll through. Um, yeah. But how, what kind of led you to that? Because, you know, like you know, we've had some, you know, some good conversations, but like what started, what was it that really started to get you to start kind of unpack the mind and start to get to that point where you're like, I want to help other people navigate this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. That's a deep question. I think, and I've, I'm wrestling with it still. And I think my answer is getting more and more clear to me. I can appreciate uh, that though. I think that's a fair answer though. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, one, one of the driving factors was being constantly, so this would be like from the, the, the high level of superficial, me being superficial and, and weird to more emotional and deep. Like, so that the top thing would be just like seeing a whole bunch of bullshit yeah. out there this is bullshit. This guy's selling stuff. This guy's managing my, you know, perception. This guy's manipulating my perception. This guy's full of shit, man. His Instagram account, I, whatever, man, you know, they're trying to sell themselves. Trying to, and and hey, I get it. There's a, there's a world for that. And there's, there's a place for it. And if that's your style, I get no, no, no judgment. That's just yeah. the path that you choose to go to represent yourself, you know, self promote. Um, there's so much self-promotion and I get it. That's how you put some, put some chicken on the table for you. You know what I mean? But that's not my style. I don't like that. I don't like to talk about myself so much. Um, my past is the past. You know, yeah. I'd rather write, I'd rather write my story for tomorrow. That's what's exciting for me. It's what excites me 
that's what excites me about other people, mm-hmm. not what they've done. Where are you at right now? Where are you going? Yeah. You know? And then, um, you know, I've had some ups and some downs, personal life, some professional life. And, and then I started sharing with people and finally enough people start giving you your own advice that you're giving everybody else and saying, how come I'm not listening to myself? Like it's, it's easy not to listen to other people, but how come you can't even listen to yourself when they're telling you and they're, and all they do is they're telling you this from a position of, of care or love. Mm -hmm. And so I just started to put myself out there a little bit more and it grew and it grew. I had a couple opportunities and I just said, okay, fine, I'll do it. You know? And, um, where I'm at now with, with my work and my podcasting and my Instagramming is just trying to share what's going on in my head and letting people know that it's okay. We work this world of managing our perceptions that uh, everything's perfect or, or, or a personality or something has the perfect life, the ideal life and they don't struggle or they don't do this or they don't do that or, or they have like all these buzzwords and these catchphrases and all these motivational speak talk and it doesn't doesn't connect with me. It doesn't work with me. I, I, I question it all. It's like, well, I, I think there needs to be a voice out there that just shares, just shares what's going in. I mean, and it, and it puts you at a position of vulnerability, and um, which is not how I grew up. How how any of us grew up in our careers, right? Being for vulnerable. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, not me. And it's funny you bring that up because I started writing just a blog. I, I just write an email to all of the members of the gym every Wednesday. My wife just, she was like, Hey, you just need to start writing. And I would, and I literally just, I do it every week. I've done it. I haven't missed a week in a year and a half. And most of the things that I write on there are just things that I've messed up in my life. And it's more of like my journal to everybody else and what I learned from it. But I, I, I kind of agree with you. Like I, I feel very uncomfortable telling people this is how they should do things. I simply tell them like, this is my story. This is what I learned. Here's what I think it meant. And it's kind of like my journal that I get to go back and read and kind of ask myself, are you full of shit? Like, is this, is this real? Is this like, is this actually useful? Are you like, why are you doing this? And I hope when I go back and read it all, it was just me thinking out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, I, are you full of shit? Right. That's a question I ask myself all the time almost every day leaving in my own bullshit looking in the mirror some people have gotten so adept at bullshitting themselves in their own face in the mirror looking themselves in their own eyes and and i get it but i think that is taking positive self-talk off the charts to the extreme and it's not healthy and so it's just like yeah i don't want to be i don't want to be that person and i think so so going back let me just stop in there but coming from a place of humility, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm who I am. I have a reputation in, in certain fields or professions or whatever. It's very, very good. And people look up to me or the name, they might not even know me, but what I represent because of what I've done or whatever, whatever, and fair or not fair. I don't know, but, but you, you stand for something in a mm-hmm. lot of people's eyes. And I wasn't aware of this projection that I was having because when you're, when you're active duty and you're a commander and you're doing things like you you have to project strength in position. The men need that. They require it. It's good. It's healthy. But, um, there's, I just burped in the mic. That's super attractive. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to cover it up, man. No, it's good. good. Um, but then like the, there's, there's, uh, a pendulum effect of that too, right? Like, wow, you know, he's doing well. He doesn't have any problems. How come he doesn't have problems? I do. And, and I'm not articulating really well right now, the full, I think people can connect the dots between, but. No, I think you are. I mean, I, I get it. So much, yeah. And so much good response from people saying, wow, I can relate. And if you're having those problems, it's, it's okay for me to have those problems too. And if it's okay for me to have these problems or have these thoughts, like now, how do you work with them? How do you manage them to, to then be okay or to, to get rid of like, I get really dark, evil, ugly thoughts and from time to time. It's normal and natural. And what happens is, is I've conditioned myself to when those are happening, to, it triggers a, a, a bulb or a light or a signal or something, an impulse that says, whoa, 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 stop, check in. What's causing this? And so I like to try to use my 
um, just my, my real talk, you know, what's going on in my head, the internal dialogue and share it out loud in a process that I have in, in organizing it. And I, I think it does a lot of things for people. It's okay to have those thoughts, teaching them how to manage them, teaching them that, you know, how to be proactive and productive, a lot of different things. And it's, I'm getting a lot of good feedback that it's helping. And it's maybe it's not for everybody, you know, but it's, it's about- tough. I'll tell you that. Like, you know, I'm not doing it nearly at the scale that you are. Like, this is just literally just stuff that I send out to our members, but the responses that I get are very much the same. You know, I'll, the responses I'll get will be to the tune of like, I didn't think that other people felt that way. I didn't think people actually struggled like this. Like this is the email I needed today from you. Mm -hmm. Um, And like I said, like none of these emails are me like making myself look good. Like they're, they're literally like my deepest, darkest secrets of like my biggest failures in life. uh, Things that I've done hor you know, horribly wrong. Um, But what I think what it's done is I I think it makes you real. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, I think, people, you know, cause that's like, that's my biggest fear is like being full of shit. Like that's why I ask myself that all the time. Like that is my biggest fear in life is like being a guy, people like that guy's full of shit. Like, and I just like, that's something I can't live with. And that's kind of how I've some like pseudo figured out how to navigate that world is like, uh, then I need to tell people the bad things about me too. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, man. I get a, you know, there's a handful of personalities out there that we all probably have heard of and listened to and, and they're, um, they're awesome. I mean, the things that they're saying, it, it, if it, if it's, if it resonates with somebody, you know, and it, and it's causing positive change, you know, like, um, uh, like it's, just, but I can't connect with it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I share more in common with this personality than 99% of the people that listen to them through, through experiences and whatnot. And I really can't relate. And it's not to say that he's right or wrong or she's right or wrong. It's just, Hey, there's gotta be other people out there that are not able to relate and yeah. not to say that his message isn't helping empower other people or help other people be more than they are or grow or be the best version of themselves or whatever you want to talk about it. Like he's probably, he is absolutely, or they are absolutely having positive effect on, on groups and listeners. But like, if I can't really relate I just imagine of, of the, the percentage that can't relate either. And so I just want to be another voice out there to help, to help grab those people and offer them something that maybe they can relate to. And I'm sure there's a, a slice of that percentage that can't relate to what I'm saying. And, that, and that's fine. But if there is a, even the smallest percentage of people that are out there that are, are listening or hearing or connecting and it's helping them, then, Hey man, I just, I just want more people to win. So, and, and to kind of bring this, because most of the people that listen to this are either coaching CrossFit or CrossFit affiliate owners. So I actually want to talk a little bit about that exact scenario because I think there's this facade. I don't think so. I know. So there's this facade about owning a gym that it's the greatest thing ever. And, you know, anytime somebody comes to ask me about it to open a gym, you know, I, I'm, I ask a lot of questions because I'm not going to tell them no but I'm going to ask a lot of questions because it's not all sunshine and rainbows. It's an incredible amount of stress. There's far more sleepless nights than there are good sleep for the vast majority of gym owners, you know, like cutting chicks, cutting checks. You don't know are going to be able to cash, like trying to make everybody in the gym happy, you know, trying to keep yourself happy and then trying to manage this entity that you've began to grow and take care of your personal life. And like, sometimes it can just be a massive disaster. And I kind of look at a gym. So I'm asking you this from, from kind of from, I guess, like both parts of your, your time in the Marine Corps and then what you're doing now for a gym owner. Cause I kind of look at a gym. It's probably pretty similar. Most gyms are probably similar to like a, a a company size element in Marine Corps, like 150, maybe 200 people, depending on the size. Like, um, I'm a little rusty on my Marine Corps. Um, Um, but very similar. We're like, there, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people that need care and feeding. Uh, and generally there's always somebody who's unhappy about something, you know, and as a gym owner, that can be really tough pill to swallow. It's like, Hey, I need to make a hard decision right now. That's going to make some people unhappy. That's going to be painful. But for the long term, this is what needs to happen. What kind of, and, and again, I'm asking you for general guidance. So, you know, 
what would you say people should really try to hone in on from that leadership standpoint? If, if you're, if you're the head honcho in a gym and you're trying to grow a good culture and you're trying to do the right thing for the right people for the right reasons, what do you see a lot of people missing the boat on? Yeah. Wow. Well, um, you know, not a gym owner. Um, seen a lot of gyms, you know, have a lot of friends that are owners of gyms, see a lot of different types, styles, ways of going about business. Um, I wouldn't say, I would say from a leader, not, not what most people are missing the mark on. I wouldn't, I wouldn't answer it that way. Maybe, okay. uh, maybe yeah, I would answer, maybe I would redirect, redirect the question or something simple, like just, um, I think the probably in my, in my mind, the, the most advantageous position to go after whatever you're trying to create is just um, let people know you care. And if you, if you start there, if you just start communicating that you genuinely care about people, you, you know, um, you have their interests, their best interest at heart. I mean, I've always said that you try to care about somebody else more than they care about themselves. It's, Probably people in the smart world would argue that it's not possible, self-preservation, something, something, but it's like, hey, I'm stubborn enough to try, you yeah. know? And when you just invest the most into that, into caring, um, and it builds, and it builds a reputation, you, you start to get the benefit of the doubt. And while people may not be happy with a decision you make or, or an action in a moment now, somewhere you've already planted that like, hey, well, man, he's going to get the benefit of the doubt because I know he cares. And, and I'm assuming that there's things going on that I'm not aware of. And there's other, there's other information that I'm not privy to in, in variables that are weighing into this decision, but he has generally the best interest for the community or our group at, at heart. And, and it just all goes back to just that, just, just genuine trying to care. And now I'm not a business guy. Yeah, I am. I am, but I'm not really like in that sense, right? I'm a, I'm a phony business guy uh, <laughs> doing what I do. <laughs> and I get like a lot of those variables are running a business that make these decisions really, really hard. You know, um, but, it's funny um, that you say that though, because I mean, leader, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. Like everybody that we've talked to, so I mean, we've had Chuck Carr as well on, uh, I'm going to Todd Whitman's going to be on, uh, I'm going to talk with him later this week and I'm, I can, pretty sure I know what he's going to say too. Yeah, um, you do. But I mean, that is the common theme and it seems kind of hokey, right? We're just like, Hey, you just got to care. And they're like, but no, that is literally sim how simple it is. I'm not saying it's easy because I mean, mm -hmm. you have to invest a lot of your emotional equity in other people and, and run on empty on many cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trying to think back of all the times that I'm like trying to really invest my emotion in this person when, when, behind me is just disaster, emotional, just <laughs> chaos, you know? And like, but that is it. Like you have to care about people. I think of uh, the most, the majority of, ah, man, how do you say this? Like, Hey, my, my set of experiences, right? Like all the other models, not all, but many, many of the other models that maybe are default models or, or, or avenues that you would say like opposite or, or different adjacent to caring as the priority. Those other models that exist out there or those other avenues, they break down. They break down when the situation is less than controlled, ideal, or comforted. And I've been in a lot of probably the, the worst scenarios you'll, you'll, you'll ever imagine. I mean, you, you as well, many of us, um, the model that seems to hold true the firmest is the one of, of caring, the position of caring. And it's not me inventing this. It's, it's through books and literature of the guys that fought in Bella Wood on Tarawa. Like we didn't fight for America. We didn't fight for freedom. We didn't fight to, to you know, and, 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 we fought for each other. Yeah. It's like, yeah, wow. I mean, it doesn't mean that freedom wasn't a part of it. It doesn't mean that America wasn't a part of it or good virtue or any of that. It's just that when yeah. Bush came to shove, it really wasn't about any of that. The only thing that mattered or the most significant thing that you could even be aware of that mattered was how much I cared about my fellow man or woman next to me, man. Yeah. And so I, I, I try to, uh, I try to default there. So with that, what is, if you don't mind me asking, like, what is your goal or vision for Cricket Butterfly? 
well, to go until it, it's not relevant. You know, I have no ambitions of being big or huge. I have, I mean, you can tell I don't really promote. Yeah. Um, just do my thing and let, let other people talk about you. And if people are still interested and they, they, then they must find what you have is valuable and you just keep going. Yeah. And if I find myself unemployed, I'll know that my message is not relevant anymore. And if people keep knocking and calling, then it must mean that, hey, what I have to say or what I have to share or offer is is effective or it's helping. And so I, I think ultimately my vision is just to keep my arms open for anybody that wants to um, come get a hug or come get some some training or challenged or, you know, different way of thinking. And but I don't have any aspirations of yeah. giant business or anything like that. I just, I just want to help. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm personally definitely going to hop on one of those because uh, I was super bummed. I saw it cause you did something with Travis Manion foundation, like last late last year, probably a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah. God, man, time's flying so fast. I don't even know where the weeks go, but like maybe three months ago, two months ago. Yeah. It was, it was not that long ago. And I was like super bummed cause uh, actually that's him right there. But um He's uh, he was a really good friend of mine. I saw that and I was like super bummed about that that I didn't I didn't realize you were there because I but but I'm definitely going to get on one of that because you know I can appreciate like what you're doing and and what because we had Bill Anthes on the show too like I can appreciate the same stuff he's doing um, and I just you know I think there's a lot of people and I think a lot of gym owners could use a little bit of that somebody to kind of like open up that aperture as far as like where their mindset is at and the questions they're asking to get a little bit more uncomfortable because I think the I think the tendency is for all of us to pretend that everything is going well because you're in a position of authority. So I have to exude this, this semblance of like, no, I've got it together. Everything's cool. You know? And I think you can, I think as I get a little bit older and ask myself more questions, I think you, there's a place for you to do both, which is like present strength while being vulnerable. It's just really hard, Mm -hmm. really hard. Um, and, and wildly uncomfortable. Yeah. Do it or, or even just kind of discern when, when is, when is the time appropriate to, you know, exert strength and when is the time appropriate to shift then towards vulnerability and know that it's a very fluid process as you're, as you're reading, you know, you're reading the environment. Did you, did, were you getting into some of this stuff? Like when you're at the Naval, were you a company officer at the Naval Academy? What did you do when you were there? Yeah. Yeah, company officer and um, battalion XO. Okay, all right. So you're the guy that everybody was afraid of most of the time. But um, what no, company? What no, company no. were? Oh, I know, I, I know you were. You <laughs> were that guy. Were like, God, I want to be in his company. Uh, I used to tell everybody, they'd say, "How many midshipmen do you have?" I was like, "I have four thousand. <laughs> They're all mine, man. They're all mine. <laughs> The more you showed a midshipman that you cared about them, the more they wanted your attention. Oh, I, I remember. I mean, I remember my time there, and I remember there there was always one or two guys that everybody would gravitate to, and it was and it was precisely because of what you just mentioned, because they cared. They legitimately cared about like what was going on in your life. They legitimately cared about your struggles there as a midshipman, about your struggles like trying to figure out your place in the world of the Naval Academy and that gigantic goat rope that it is. And, um, Mm -hmm. but, um, did you, did you spend a lot of time doing this type of stuff when you were there? Or is it a little bit lower level? I mean, like most midshipmen are kind of idiots for the most part. Like you you just, you're like just trying to figure it out when you're there. You're like, uh, show up on time and not be, not get in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was wrestling. I started, I think I started doing some interest, some deep introspection, you know, part of the company officer program is to go through, um, your, your master's degree at university of Maryland on leadership and academic mm-hmm. development, something, and, uh, was presented with a lot of cool stuff, you know, and you go there thinking like, what is some, what's some professor that's been stuck in, what are they going to teach me about leadership? And come on, man. <laughs> I mean, I lived leadership for as long as this person's been reading about it yeah but i went with an open mind i just said hey man and i and i got the i got the science you know the theory the research the philosophy behind my anecdotal experience you know and um i learned a lot and it caused me to ask a lot of questions get very very introspective and that's maybe where it started but i didn't you know i retired 
and I basically went to Santa Cruz and just kind of, well, I went to lived on my boat. I lived on my tugboat for like. Oh, no, we talked about that. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, but then I went. I went to Santa Cruz to be with Nicole, you know, and hang out, and just didn't really know what I was doing. Digging into the CrossFit thing, and really like the being on the level one seminar staff is a lot exactly like we're talking about. Like these people come in to learn, and you actually invest in trying to help them be better. Like better have a better understanding of health and fitness and wellness and movement so that they can take control and you really care about the participants at the level one and um so that was really it was a really cool transition for me that i got to do that with a level one and yeah you know some opportunities to train you know like robert guerrero and work his ass for a while and uh, then a couple of gigs popped up here and there hey gosh would you do this would you do that and it wasn't really until we we transitioned, settled back in Colorado and I was given a, a couple really cherry opportunities and it was all just word of mouth, you know, yeah. just lightning striking a tree and you happen to be right nearby. And I was like, Oh wow, cool, man. I get to be part of that. And it just um, started to grow a little organically. That's really cool. And, uh, and you were shooting arrows last week, right? I was man. What a blast, man. Is that your therapy these days? It is. It, it is uncanny. How, therapeutic it is it um you know you talk to Dudley about it he's on a quest man he's on a quest to uh help vets and he thinks archery is the way archery and hunting together and you know it might sound hokey for that but like as a vet like there's some things about archery and things about like you know pccs and pcis and you know gear lists and methods and procedures and checks and balances and all of these things and discipline and discipline and trying to master and that something gets away and then you got to go again and repetition and rehearsal, rehearsal, all of that stuff that we lived for how long Fern, you know, in the military, it was, it's who we are. And if it's part of this whole archery thing and I was just blessed because, you know, I met Dutch through Stump. Stump's an amazing dude. Yeah. He, well, for those of you who don't know, so Andy Stump, uh, if you haven't listened to this podcast, it's cleared hot, but then but Tosh talking about uh, John Dudley, who's, I don't know, he's, probably the best archer in the world at this point, probably. I mean, I, I think so, but you know, I might be biased, but he's, yeah. he's the man. He's the man. He's a great yep. human being too. But it's interesting because uh, I, I've, I'm seeing a lot of guys gravitate to that these days. And, and a lot of them are, at least from what I'm seeing, seeing this, it's just very therapeutic. And I don't, I don't know if it's the absolute, concentration required that you kind of have to you can only do that and you, you can't be concentrating on anything else that makes it therapeutic but you know I don't shoot but I, I do I do find myself lately finding that I need to find something that is therapeutic like mm-hmm. I need to pick up something whether it's like jujitsu or or that or something else I need to find something yeah it might not be the end all and it might not be for everybody but I'll tell you what it's working for a handful of us and I think it can work for thousands of handfuls more and we just keep keep pushing keep pressing forward and um but there is there's something about it that just it just feels good it's focus yeah it's a distraction probably you know um, but if it's therapy it's it's very i'm funny somebody gave me a book called the zen of archery and i'm digging through this it's a super quick read it's like 75 pages oh, nice. it's like yeah this book articulates even better that it's like yeah this is it man and i enjoy this this is my little piece. I feel more productive. And um, I mean, I, I enjoy some cool stuff, you know, like adventure racing is, is very therapeutic for me, you know, going for a run, just, just the same as for another person that's boxing and in Jack and steel. You just have to find what, what clicks for you. And uh, this is clicking for me on more levels than, than most of the stuff I've found. That's really cool. Are, have you toyed around with, uh, with meditation at all? Yeah, not so much. I know I should. Nicole's doing it quite a bit and people do it and, and I'm interested, but man. Yeah. I, like I, I, I Andrea, Andrea gave me a book, Andrea Smith. She gave me a book and I like, I don't, I'm kind of on the, I'm not on the fence. Like I know it's a good thing, but I don't know that everybody, like, I think you pick it up when you're ready, but that's, mm-hmm. that's my personal feeling. That's just literally me guessing. Like I, I don't know. Um, but I try, I've, I've tried it and I really struggle with it. Like, I just like, I feel like my, but she gave me a good book and it kind of explained meditation and kind of, uh, 
it kind of dispelled a lot of myths that you're supposed to have this like calm feeling and you're not supposed to have any thoughts. And it, and it kind of walks you through meditation is like, no, no, your, your thoughts are passing and your job is just to kind of observe. It's, it's not to not have any thoughts. It's just more to just observe your own thoughts and be okay with it. That that's a weird thought or like, that's a negative thought. And I'm like, why am I thinking that? And that made it a little bit easier, but I've just, I've really struggled to do it. And I wasn't sure if you'd play it around. Yeah, I like that. I like that that last part that you were just talking about, like just observe and just be in tune. That was the thing. Yeah. That was the thing that really clicked with me in that book. And I forgot what it, I think it's, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll text it to you. But, um, but that was something that I really kind of gravitated for towards because I had always thought that it was like nothing just blank, you know, blank mind. And, um, she explained it really well. And, And the way she explained it was that you're just a host to all of the thoughts in your mind, meaning you can interact and, and depart those thoughts whenever you want. Your job is not to talk to any one particular person for any particular amount of time. It's just to kind of float around the room and interact where and how you want to with your own thoughts. And that made it way more palatable when I was trying to, it, it made me, it made it not frustrating. That's what I'll tell you. That that's the, that's the best thing I can say about it. It, it made yeah, it not that sounds super empowering. Yeah, it made it not frustrating, which was the which was the hardest part about when I had tried to do it in the past. So, mm-hmm. um, but anyway, well, listen, man, I want to be respectful of your time, um, and I know you'd mentioned a book. You, do you have any other books you recommend to people? Like, if there is there like a book that you think that's like been impactful for you? Man, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, like, I don't read as much as I want to. Maybe I don't want to, and that's why I'm not reading. And I'm just saying I don't, I don't want to. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know there's some voodoo mind stuff right there. I've read a handful of books. You know, I think the best thing to do is stop trying to read what other people want you to read. What, what interests you? What's your, what mood are you in? Pick the, find it and just do it and engage. You know, uh, I found myself through times like focusing on military history and then focusing on self-help and then just focusing on fiction and, and drifting. And there's a lot of great books out there. Um, uh, Nicole just got done reading Moby Dick and okay. the way she talked about that excites me. And I think I'm going to dig into that one next because um, just learning about Herman Melville and, and what he was and what he did and what was the genesis for doing and writing this book. And then she talks about the language of it and the articulation and the, the, the use of words. And she's just super fascinated with that book. So that's a book that I'm going to dig into next. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm just putting down, getting ready to finish, put down uh, the Zen of archery. Yeah. Which was, is really good. It, it's given me a, understanding of why this is working yeah um, I, I agree with you that like people I think there's a lot of pressure to read books you know I sadly enough graduated college never once read a book I don't know how but barely <laughs> I was I was in the running for anchor man at the Naval Academy but the um, the first book I ever read was a book called my losing season and the only reason I read it is because as I was reading it it was like somebody else was reading my own life story to me at that time Mm -hmm. and then from there I picked up other books that I found interesting but I mean until then and I was probably 22 23 until then like I mean reading I mean you couldn't pay me to read a book at that point and Mm -hmm. I have a rule now which is like if I'm reading a book and I don't enjoy it I just stop reading it it's just a waste of time at that point because I'm not going to retain it. It's not going to be useful. I'm going to get pissed off about it. So if I'm three pages in, I'm like, forcing yourself to finish it. And, yeah. I'm like, this is, yeah. I'm pissed now because now I could be doing something else. So if I'm three pages in and I think this book sucks, I'll really just put it back in the stack and go find another one. How about this? Can I ask you then, um, not maybe books, but like, how about podcasts? Like you're in the podcast business. Um, you're doing that. Like everybody, oh, I listen to Joe Rogan. I listen to someone. I listen to someone. So, but is there is there any podcast that you're listening to that is is thought provoking? It's it's new. It's intellectually stimulating uh, that, that um, you're onto. You know, not currently, and I'm I've been kind of on a mission for something like that lately because a lot of it is, you know, either politically driven or um, I'll I'll pick and choose here and there. You know, I I, I truthfully you know, not because we're doing this podcast. I truthfully enjoy listening to Andy's stuff. I think he's an incredibly thoughtful person. I think he's um, far more articulate than most. Uh, Mm -hmm. The way he can express his emotions. Um, 
I will occasionally pick and choose from some of Tim Ferriss's guests because he can go deep on some different things with regard to depression and some other stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I kind of hop around on podcasts. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really into one particular person as much as I am to like topics, mm-hmm. whether it's yeah, mindset. Or, picking interests. Yeah. Um, and I'm the same way with podcasts. If I don't like it, I turn it off. Um, and I'll always have something that's kind of like white noise playing in the background a lot of times, but I can't think of anything right now that I'm like really hooked on. Um, oh no, there is one. This one is, has nothing to do with mindset, but there's one that I just started listening to. It's called Apollo 11, what we saw. Mm, and I cool. God, I can't remember the guy's name. His name is It's crazy interesting, but this guy gives basically a backseat description of, you know, basically from the, when the space race started and he kind of goes through that whole timeline and he was there with, with everybody through all of it, kind of all the way up to Tesla's and Tesla and Elon Musk and everything like that. But it's really interesting to hear this guy talk about, you know, Neil Armstrong and, and like watching these guys deal with stress and like the most catastrophic scenarios and like uh, all that stuff it, it's it's pretty interesting um that's one well, so. 11 yeah right on man check that out awesome dude well listen i know you're a busy man so uh thank you my friend i appreciate your time dude this is awesome i really appreciate it yeah you're welcome man and thank you it's super good to see you connect yeah. man i'll see you in madison where uh where can people find you on social and uh and kind of check your you know cricket butterfly out I have my um, personal account, Tosh.CrookedButterfly. And I, really, I don't leverage it for personal gain. It's I'm just yeah. sharing thoughts like we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, deep thinking and then maybe not necessarily deep thinking. but And then I have um, my business form. My business uh, Instagram is just Crooked Butterfly. Cool. They basically share the same accounts, but that, that's where I'm at. Awesome. All right, brother. Guys, check out Tosh. And uh, if you haven't, go follow his Instagram. Like, There's some, some thought-provoking stuff in there. It's good stuff, man. Right on for a man. Good seeing you, bro. Yeah, you too, brother. Thanks.